Yes, please. Okay. Thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this webinar. Uh, my name is Amanda Glassman. I'm the Executive Vice President at the Center for Global Development. I'm happy to be joining uh, with the UN and the partner organizations listed to talk about a really important issue in the fight against COVID-19, which is data. I hope that everyone, wherever you are, is safe and staying well. I know that everyone is uh, engaged in, in this battle in different ways, so we're grateful that you chose to join us today in this discussion. Of course, a very important part of every webinar is to ask everyone who is not speaking to please mute their microphones. Thank you. Um, this webinar series is a virtual extension of the UN World Data Forum that tries to create spaces for discussion and cooperation between government, international agencies, civil society, and the private sector. There are a number of interesting questions that have already come uh, to the organizers, and we will pick a few that the panelists will address after their presentation. You can also send questions to the host privately via the chat window throughout the session. And you can discuss issues with other participants in that chat window as well. Um, again, a reminder to mute. Uh, it's uh, the rule of the day. And before we begin, I want to hand over to the UN Statistical Division to introduce a recently launched data hub and some other upcoming events related to COVID response. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Luis Gonzalez from the Statistics Division, and, and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, share with you some of the work we are uh, doing in collaboration with uh, our partners uh, in, in support of the work that uh, all of you are doing, uh, making data available to address the COVID-19 crisis. So, let me start by telling you. Uh, on April 16, the Statistics Division of the United Nations Department of Economic Affairs and Social Affairs uh, uh, launched uh, this initiative in partnership with ESRI uh, on a UN COVID-19 data hub. The link is uh, provided in the chat window, and uh, this is part of our efforts to provide access to software and tools to countries that will enable them to share authoritative data through a federated network of COVID-19 data hubs. The network seeks to empower uh, countries to use web GIS technologies to share geospatially enabled data resources in the form of open and interoperable web services. And it helps national statistical offices get to speed in building their own COVID-19 open data sites and dashboards with ready-to-use templates so that they can focus on responding to the urgent demand for data and insights from their own constituencies. So in addition to that, uh, the UN Statistics Division is also collaborating with uh, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data and with Open Data Watch through a joint COVID-19 response website. The link is also provided in the chat window now. This website provides guidance and tools and shares best practices to ensure the operational continuity of data programs by national statistical offices and to address issues on, of open and timely access to critical data to respond to the global COVID-19 crisis. And lastly, I would like to invite you all to stay tuned for the upcoming Twitter chat at uh, noon at 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern time here in, uh, noon in New York, uh, right after this web webinar. Uh, Please follow the hashtag COVID data chat and join the UN Statistics Division, the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, and Open Data Watch to continue the conversation, to share your thoughts, experiences, and follow-up questions with other statistical experts around the world on the role of national statistical systems in ensuring that reliable and timely data is available and ready to use in informing the fight against COVID-19. The link on how to join the Twitter chat is provided in the chat, chat window as well. And uh, with this, I thank you. And uh, uh, now over to our moderator. Many thanks. Um, I'll just uh, give a few comments before we get started. 
I think there's probably uh, no time in memory when health data has been so important for so many other sectors of the economy. And it brings a new focus on, on the importance of data, timely data, real-time data to inform policies and planning. Um, and what do we mean by data and timely data? There's, of course, uh, the problem of identifying COVID-19 cases and associated mortality. Um, but recent, uh, you know, as the pandemic goes on, we know that all-cause mortality information is enormously important as well. The other piece that is increasing in importance is administrative data on uh, from facilities, health facility, on utilization, on cases, as well as real-time economic and behavioral response data to understand whether measures to control the pandemic are working or not and how long they need to work for in order for us to see a pause in uh, transmission. We'd also like to see disaggregated data by age, ethnicity, sex, location, other markers. That is of vital importance. We're seeing lots of um, differentiated impacts of this epidemic as, as it unfolds. And so the topic of this uh, discussion is that from the point of the view, point of view of the statistical community, both the st official statistics and those engaged in non-official statistics, as well as the use of this data, are we ready for such a big challenge? What can we learn from experience so far? Um, I think we've all been following uh, the UK's Office of National Statistics very closely as they were among the first to post information on excess deaths in total. And we were able to understand in real time how um, what we're seeing in facilities is not the whole story of what is going on as part of this crisis. So governments are working together with partners at the national and global level to deal with the current emergency by adapting innovative data production methods and processes to ensure collection of critical data at various levels. We'll be looking at some of those experiences. Um, and data collected routinely by national statistics offices are also being used to forecast gaps in required health service resources, such as hospital beds. And, and this is quite important to be able to respond to the crisis effectively. We use these data in, in models. And of course, we have um, the great Chris Murray here from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, who will talk a little bit about how the data feeds into the models his group is developing and disseminating. Um, but the point is, we're using data in, a real in real time, uh, and it makes a huge difference for what happens with outcomes. And, and we're able to see that every single day in a way that I don't think is, is so obvious during normal times. So our panelists uh, have already mentioned, we have uh, Dr. Christopher Jail Murray from the IHME and the University of Washington. Uh, we have Ramesh Krishnamurti from the World Health Organization who works in the data um, area. We have Frankie Kay from the Office of National Statistics in the United Kingdom and Wilma Guillen, who's the Assistant National Statistician for Social Sector Statistics in the Philippines Statistical Statistics Agency. I think this is a remarkable set of people and perspectives to hear on this topic, and I'm looking forward to hearing from them today. I also hope they'll tell us a little bit about what was the state of our data at baseline before all this started on things like all-cause mortality, cause of death, even death registration, particularly in low- and middle-income countries, is important, and how, how our starting point is affecting what we can produce today. So to start off, we'll start with Chris Murray. Um, I've, I've already mentioned who he is, so I'll just turn it right over and let's get started. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you very much, uh, Amanda, for the introduction and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody online. Uh, I come from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. We're about uh, 500 people that work generally on the quantification of health and around the world. Uh, one of our signature efforts is the Global Burden of Disease, which produces annual national and subnational assessments of every disease in terms of disability adjusted life years, uh, you know, other metrics like disease incidence prevalence, and also the assessment of risk factors. And we routinely forecast that 
uh, 25 years into the future. So it was a natural thing when the COVID-19 uh, epidemic unfolded and we were contacted by our own hospital system here in the state of Washington to help them understand the surge that might be coming on the hospital system. So we developed a forecast model for that purpose. Uh, other hospitals uh, then asked us for uh, similar uh, efforts. We decided to just do every state in the United States uh, rather than hospital system by hospital system. And then once we started releasing and updating our COVID forecasts uh, on a, a four to five times a week basis, uh, they have become quite widely used in this country, including by the White House. And we have expanded our modeling to countries in Europe. Uh, we have models that we're working on with the Pan American Health Organization for countries in Latin America. And we do plan to have uh, similar models for every country in the world eventually. Uh, that's a bigger lift than simply doing it in the places that uh, have larger epidemics where the statistical modeling approach that we use is, is more robust in those settings. So that's how we got into trying to look at COVID-19 uh, modeling. And I think what might be useful is to discuss the types of data that go into our models and the diversity of sources. Uh, and then I'll try to draw a few lessons in the last minute or so. So first, not surprisingly, we use daily cases and deaths. Deaths, despite all the problems, which I'll come to of deaths, deaths are a more robust measure in the presence of uh, limited testing than cases. The trend in cases can, as we're seeing in the US right now, can be very misleading when you scale up uh, testing quite substantially, or when testing is in great, in very short supply, such as in a place like Mexico. So we have put more emphasis on deaths, but we certainly use cases and deaths. Uh, the second type of data we use, and it's data that is enormously valuable uh, in, in tracking the epidemic and understanding what's going to happen in the next seven to 14 days, that is hospitalizations. Um, interestingly, many countries, uh, including states in, and regions in high income countries, don't have mechanisms to report on daily admissions by cause uh, effectively. But where you have it, it is enormously helpful, as is use of oxygen, admissions to the ICU, uh, use of ventilators, and length of stay. All of those go into our health resource forecasting model. Uh, the third type of data that we increasingly depend on, especially in the setting where there's vigorous debates about social distancing, and that is mobility data that's collected uh, through the use of cell phone apps. There are four, or at least four, that we're using. Those include Descartes Lab, SafeGraph, Google, and Facebook. Now, interestingly, all of those are private sector companies and not the public sector but their resources, which they're making uh, pretty widely available, uh, are enormously helpful in understanding what's the impact on mobility of different distancing mandates and how is the human behavioral response, which drives the epidemic, uh, going to unfold. Another area of data that's becoming increasingly important in this phase of the epidemic is testing data, both tests uh, delivered and the positivity rate, both of which matter a lot as we go forward or once you get over the initial first wave peak, if you are a country in that situation. We spend quite considerable time trying to track at the local level uh, mandates, whether they're at the administrative one, administrative two, or national level for social distancing. A newer issue that, for again, for which it's some of these rapid data platforms that are out there that use cell phone surveying uh, may prove very useful as mask use, as we recognize in many settings that that may be an important intervention in the future. One that's just coming online that we are trying to calibrate to where we think the test is robust 
is antibody testing. There are many bad tests out there, but where the test has reasonably high specificity, we are able to calibrate the models to make sure that the infection fatality rate that goes into the models is accurate, and therefore we can figure out what fraction of people have been exposed. And then as Amanda started at the beginning, we're finding uh, substantial use for daily all-cause and cause-specific mortality, but very few locations in the world are actually able to report that in a timely way. And even then, most are just reporting uh, all-cause mortality. Now, there's some really good examples where, where cause-specific is also available and that is enormously useful and helpful. So those are the types of data that go into our forecast models. If you haven't seen our forecast models, they're all uh, on the web. They're updated uh, four or five times a week. Uh, you just go to COVID-19 at healthdata.org. Now, what have we learned through this process and through the process of very extensive public engagement? Uh, in using our models, both in the, in the wider spread media and with many, many different uh, political groups, whether they're governors, uh, you know, people in the federal government or in other countries as well. First, uh, clearly data needs to be timely to be useful in a fast moving pandemic. So this new stress on daily reporting is enormously important. And we see real problems in the data on Sunday and Monday, where often you see uh, big reductions in reporting. It makes people think that the epidemic is peaking, and then on Tuesday, you get catch up uh, from the people who are collating the data, and you get a big spike. And this doesn't happen everywhere, but it happens on, in enough places that it really uh, you know, clouds the signal in, in a substantial way. The second observation is that uh, there's a lot of biases in data. We know that there is day of the event, whether a case, a hospitalization, or a death, and then there's the day that that gets reported. And that's inevitable that there's lags in reporting, but if that is made transparent, then on the modeling side, we can try to take that into account. We're also seeing um, a lots of confusion from different um, jurisdictions even within one country, some reporting presumptive diagnoses and some only reporting the confirmed. Uh, and these are really major issues that are clouding, clouding the, the trend in the epidemic. The third general observation uh, that we have is that public release of the data is enormously important. The uh, capacity to analyze, debate, and discuss in something, something that is as critically important as the response to the pandemic really benefits from broad-based engagement in the analysis, the modeling, and the discussion. And in some places uh, where data is you know, held rather closely and tightly, I think we can see that uh, government, uh, governments in those jurisdictions are in a weaker position to respond than when the data is more publicly available. Now, the last comment is that uh, because we have not in the past in many settings, including in high income settings like the United States, had a lot of emphasis on daily tracking of what happens in hospitals, which are really these the sentinel sites for telling us about severe disease, there is a huge potential, especially preparing for the next wave of the epidemic to build up a, essentially a sentinel hospital system where you, you invest in high quality daily data so that when and if there is a resurgence, that signal comes through immediately and clearly and quickly. So those are some uh, framing comments. I will stop there and only, uh, you know, the last comment for those online just to say that uh, our work on COVID-19 is meant to be a public service. We are certainly uh, happy and willing and have been engaging with thousands of groups uh, in the last few weeks in trying to help them understand the models that we produce and tailor them to each jurisdiction uh, if the data are available and can be analyzed. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your, your time. 
Thanks, Chris. Uh, we'll come back to you with some questions in a bit. Let's move on to our second speaker, uh, Ramesh Krishnamurti. He's the Senior Advisor of the Division of Data and Analytics and Delivery for Impact at the World Health Organization. Um, he's worked for some time, uh, especially uh, to strengthen India's Integrated Disease Surveillance Program and Strategic Health Operations Centers, both at the center and the state levels. I think that's a very important perspective right now. So let's turn it over to you, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, for the opportunity for WHO to be present here, I think, in this very important forum. Uh, can I uh, go to the first slide, please? So I'll just briefly speak with you on the India's response to COVID-19 and how they are managing data and information uh, systems. Next, please. So, uh, you know, uh, when the first case began, India seriously took this uh, uh, you know, this matter to the point where Prime Minister's Office established a full-scale interministerial coordination unit. That was the starting point where all entities were supposed to come together uh, to solve and oh. observing what was going on. The real-time data that a uh, country needed, which is a disaggregated data by age, sex, and location, hospital readiness, medical supplies, everything else, they wanted to put together to begin to collect and also get ready to see what would come uh, in the future once the first case uh, came into being. They started to screen around now close to a million uh, passengers across all of the airports in India. And they also begin to monitor community surveillance uh, in such a way that they were able to track people, uh, track the contacts, and also give full treatment for those cases. Next, please. Now, just to give you an idea, uh, uh, Government of India has now the enhanced uh, special surveillance system, which is actually monitoring all of the COVID uh, uh, cases and contacts and uh, all the infrastructure needs and also the medical supplies, commodities, everything else. The data feeds come from various levels across the geographic region and all of the administrative boundaries up to the level of a village. And uh, we have uh, one system called the Integrated Disease Surveillance Program System that gives a line listing of cases. And then the second one gives all the aggregate data, the health management information systems. And the third one is actually the mapping system that gives all the mapping of cases and contacts. They're all working seamlessly together to provide massive amount of data. And of course, on the ground, we have hundreds and hundreds of people working at all levels to collect and feed the data to the system. Next, please. Just to give you an idea here. So, you know, this is a, a case investigation forum, levels of details the data has been collected all of data related to laboratories, to patients, to clinical information, all the way down to the public health response. All of these are highly granular data about a person in the geographic context. Next, please. Now, uh, this case investigation forum line listing is constantly updated, searchable, retrievable, cases are being followed, and then we begin to extract basic information to manage the case on the ground and also supply the basic needs for the facilities, whether it is uh, 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 ventilators or others. Next, please. Now, the line listing, and, and especially also the lines that are confirmed for a a cases that are being tested positive, we need to know all of the details uh, insofar as real-time data is concerned that can be mapped and shown in various ways for various people on need. This is particularly useful for generating enormous number of interpretations on the ground because India is a vast country with over 1.3 billion people and around 38 state and territories. These are all the data coming in central place. Next, please. Now, I want to just show you simple graphs and charts. You have here a uh, total number of cases of gender, uh, cases by gender, cases by age distribution pyramids, and you have gender uh, insofar as gender distribution uh, insofar as recovery rates are concerned, all of these stack graphs are male and female. Then you have over time uh, comorbidities in patients uh, and as well as distribution of cation by, by um, uh, age categories and urban and rural distributions as well as uh, international passenger distribution and also uh, cases patients with uh, signs uh, at the time of admission and also symptoms at the times of admission. Then we have many uh, what you call the state versus national averages that are being put in and also total number of cases tested, total positive, and of course, uh, uh, the uh, distribution of cases by day over time that is all being produced. And there are many, many more, including doubling time, uh, time distribution of positive cases, number of contam uh, containment zones, the red, green, and, uh, and orange zones, 
and so on. So there's enormous amount of interpretation graphs that are coming in. Next, please. So also is another system that gives aggregate data of total SARI and ILI cases, severe acute, uh, severe acute respiratory infections, and also influenza like infection cases that are all coming in. Uh, that are coming from over 200,000 health facilities across India in a central place. And this is also being used for decision making. Next, please. Now you can see the charts and graphs are also being used, but also visualization of data is done through geospatial data analytics engine. You can drill this down to the level of a health facility or a district, sub-district, all the way down to village level in terms of knowing the patient, knowing their a particular patient history and also the other contacts who have been affected nearby, all of those can be visualized on the map. So this is a very powerful geospatial tool that's being used to understand for containment of cases. Next, please. Now, this gives you a, uh, you know, holistic picture of India as a whole as to what is happening. We can drill this map down at various levels and the graphical interpretation changes in so far as uh, what is being measured on the right side with all the other graphs on the bottom of this particular screen that will give you what I've already shown you. Many, many measurements are done real time. Next, please. So what does it do? Uh, if you think about it, to make this thing all happen, the first thing is that intersectoral collaboration and coordination is actually very, very necessary in large and complex countries such as India. So we have learned that, that it is essential and government of India took the first step. Awesome. Second one is, Disaggregated patient data, you know, along with clinical, laboratory, drugs, logistics, and so on and so forth, they were all needed for emergency response. What it translates is that you have to collect and design the forms to begin with, and then, of course, you can make this analysis possible. Then you should have patient-centric integrated information platform, the real-time information system that India already had called the integrated health information platform, was the first step that India took in order to make this happen. Of course, uh, you know, health systems preparedness and response uh, does require highly granular data. So we were very, very clear from day one, and that, that's what we already knew, so to speak, is what we learned. And uh, the case in point here is that an individual case can be tracked all the way down to the village in the midst of uh, 1.3 billion people. And that, I think, is a no uh, simple task that government of India has accomplished. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, thank you. I wanted to ask you one question just to extend. So most health service utilization is in the private sector in India. And the question mm -hmm. is, does this system cover private facilities and if so how? Yes, a large sector, large amount of data is coming from the private sector also for insofar as cases that are being tested. And private health facilities are fully participating in creating what is called as the uh, uh, COVID healthcare centers. There are designated hospitals for COVID. Some of them are private sector. Wh whoever is participating in it, all this data is coming into the central system. Okay, thanks. All right, well, thank, thank you for your comments. I think it's an interesting example of um, combining disease surveillance system data with facility and lab data, very, very important. Um, and uh, this coverage of public and private facilities, I'll assume that it's very hard to get that to be complete. And, and that's why maybe the mortality data and other sources are gonna be very important as well in the response. Let's, let's now turn to uh, Frankie Kay. She is the Interim Deputy National Statistician and Director General for Data Capability at the Office for National Statistics in the United Kingdom. She's responsible for the capability at ONS to ensure that everyone has the technology and skills that enable them to do their job effectively. Um, and uh, ONS has really played a very important role in ground truthing um, the, the response uh, as it unfolds and, and adjusting policies as the government proceeds. Uh, Frankie, please, thanks. Great, thank you um, everybody. Um, lovely to talk to you um, from the UK. So if you just move on to the first slide. So I'm um, just going to cover briefly uh, in terms of the, um, the work that we've been doing um, at the ONS in terms of understanding the social and economic impact um, of COVID um, and how we're working across government um, and with our health departments um, to provide insight um, and also some of the challenges that, we, that we've overcome and some ones that we're still looking um, at how we can address. So move on, please. 
So in terms of our role, um, ONS has been very much at the heart of providing data and analysis um, to help shape the UK's response to COVID. A lot of our data is being used by our central government in terms of the COBRA meeting, which is um, chaired by the uh, Prime Minister in terms of responding um, to the current situation. And for us, our role is very much about providing up-to-date uh, data uh, and analysis so that people can make and um, understand uh, what is happening in terms of the response, both for those that are leading it, but also for businesses and for the public more widely so that they um, have a better understanding of what is happening. Uh, and this involves us very much collaborating across government, but also with the private sector. Uh, and to do that, we've been developing both new surveys, but also accessing uh, new administrative data as well. Um, so interestingly enough, the first thing that we actually did was that we did turn to um, perhaps more traditional methods of using two uh, and introducing two new key surveys. One of them is very much around understanding how COVID-19 is um, impacting people's lives. This is a weekly um, survey. Um, with a good response rate of around 60% um, and a sample of about 2000, of 2,000. And what we're looking there is answering a range, asking a range of questions on social impact um, on people, households and communities. Uh, and it's helping us gain insight in terms of people's well-being, um, loneliness, uh, social distancing. We've also um, set up a new um, business survey um, to understand what impact there is on businesses in the UK. Um, this is um, a fortnightly online survey um, of around uh, 18,000 businesses. And um, we've had a much lower response rate on this one. It's quite tricky for us at the moment to understand um, which businesses are still um, actually trading um, and which ones are in furlough. Um, but we're uh, analysing those results um, weekly um, and we're publishing those. And this is about understanding whether which businesses have temporarily paused trading, things like changes in employment, how many employees are being furloughed. And there's various government schemes that are supporting businesses at the moment. And we're interested in understanding um, the applications to those schemes. And also looking at, in terms of the impacts uh, in prices and costs and import and exports, uh, exports um, for businesses as well. One of the things that we've launched um, just in the last week is um, a UK serology study. And this is a major new study being led by Ox uh, Oxford University and the ONS. And it's about trying to understand and track COVID-19 in the general population. Uh, like some countries, um, we've not um, done as much testing in, in, in the community um, as uh, perhaps we would have liked. Um, so this is um, trying to address, partially address that gap. And um, so we're looking to measure rates of infection and also how many people um, have um, developed antibodies. Um, and this is actually a survey with questions, but also with people going out and collecting blood samples and swabs. Um, and we'll be doing this um, for around, um, we're piloting at the moment, so around 11,000 households, but we aim to move up to 300,000 over the next 12 months, um, and this will be a year-long study. Uh, we've also been looking at how we can supplement our existing labour force surveys to understand what's happening in the uh, employment um, situation as well. Um, and uh, looking at new experimental employment estimates as we've needed to move our surveys online from our traditional field um, uh, collection mode. So in terms of those of the surveys that we've been using, we have also been looking um, very much at how we uh, can use administrative data, both in the private and public sector. Um, and this has been really important in terms of uh, informing uh, policy decisions, both in our science, science advisors um, uh, group and also the COBRA meetings as well. Um, and so we've been really looking at understanding the impact of social di distancing. So we've been working with partners such as Google and Apple. So really understanding um, the impact on uh, transport um, in terms of locations on things like parks in the UK. Um, when we first went into lockdown, we had a lot of people still um, uh, congregating in parks. So we've been looking at, um, looking at that. And this really helps the government understand the, um, the effectiveness of social distancing. Mm -hmm. 
we're also been looking at Wi-Fi connections as well um, and mobile phones so we can sort of see how far people are moving away from their local areas. One of the things that we'd be focusing on a lot is the clearly um, is, is the death. So again, ONS has access to um, our uh, death registrations and that is probably the most robust source um, of, of deaths that we have in the UK. Um, the, we do have daily figures, um, but um, the registrations come through on a weekly basis. Um, and we're, uh, we're looking to see whether we can improve the timeliness of that. Um, what we're also trying to do is understand the underlying causes and other uh, co comorbidities as well in terms of, of people that um, are dying. Another piece of work that we've been doing is really looking at that excess death estimate. So trying to understand the indirect impact. Um, so looking in terms of COVID-19, this includes the number of years of life lost. And we're looking also to understand um, death that are happening as an indirect result of pressure on our health and care system. Um, and also um, deaths that may result from behavioural or social interventions and the economic downturn. We also want to include more work in terms of measurement in qualities. Um, and we know that we will need to update assumptions as um, we begin to return to work in the UK um, and also understand better what's happening um, with GDP. We're also looking at adding in data from um, something called our Care Quality Commission um, as the death in, in care homes has been much less timely. We're also looking in the future to, um, a, to do further analysis on linking um, um, hospital data, infections, um, deaths, recoveries to a variety of different socio-demographic variables as well, so that we can understand much better um, occupations, um, uh, ethnicities, and so on, and understanding what's really happening in terms of both recovery and death within um, our communities. Um, and we also want to be able to analyze that uh, more thoroughly by lower levels of geography as well. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so in terms of some of the challenges, um, I've touched on some of them. Um, the, the surveys that we, um, that we stood up were done in a matter of days, um, uh, and that was a big challenge for us, um, but something that uh, we feel that um, has been um, very successful. Um, and one of the others is trying to ingest and analyze a really wide range of commercial and admin uh, data, uh, real-time data, and our data science campus um, it's something that has worked really well in terms of um, being able to help us achieve that. Um, in terms of the, the things that I think we're still um, finding difficult, getting access to the data, and um, there's a lot of data available, making understanding it, making sense of it, trying to, um, to, uh, to bring it together in a coherent way, when there's lots of different sources and lots of different people involved, um, it's still proving quite challenging. Um, and it's really understanding that data um, and provoke, being able to provide a clear narrative. Um, the response rates um, in terms of our, our traditional surveys are dropping quite considerably. Um, we uh, still do a lot of um, field um, activities in terms of our surveys and at the moment we can't follow up in the field. So we're having to consider uh, different ways that we can um, uh, get new data sources to address um, the gaps um, in, in the data that we're getting from our surveys. And again, as somebody mentioned earlier, there's concern in terms of bias, so those that are filling in online and whether we're getting bias in our surveys as a result. And another big challenge for us in terms of businesses is really understanding whether they have ceased trading completely or the non-responses because they've gone out of business um, or whether they are being furloughed and they are temporarily ceasing trading. And that's proving quite difficult. Um, and um, something that we're particularly keen to understand is back in 2008, it was understanding what was really happening in businesses um, in terms of um, their, um, their life cycle that, that we did struggle. So that's something that we're focusing on a lot as well. Um, so it's been a really interesting time. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Frankie. I think you've hit on some really important uh, issues that were also raised uh, by Chris and Ramesh. Firstly, that you're changing the content modality and frequency of some of your routine um, statistical products, um, that you're working more with unofficial data and data from companies uh, as part of this, 
Um, and you touched on a really important point that I just want to underscore. It's the analytical capacity, but also to take that analytical capacity, the analysis and talk about what the implications are for policy in real time. This is enormously important. And the other um, uh, point just to underscore that you made is around the partnership in some data collection uh, efforts. In, in the case of the serology survey, the partnership with the university, I'm sure there are others that you could name. Um, and that's, I, I think, something, especially for those living in lower income countries, something quite important to consider, given that there are a number of ongoing data collection efforts that are happening by universities or non-governmental organizations. Are there ways to partner more systematically between national statistics offices and these entities. Um, and then we also had a really uh, great uh, question pop up on the chat that we'll return to later. And that is, what, you know, is there a body, is it the World Health Organization or others? Uh, but it seems to me that it has to be beyond WHO because it affects all kinds of uh, pieces of our societies. But is there kind of a recommended common minimum data set? Um, should we be trying to norm more um, the, the reporting, for example, confirmed versus presumptive cases, et cetera. I, I don't know how good our guidance is on that collectively. So that's something for our panelists to reflect on. Let's now turn to Wil Vilma Ascano Guillen, who's the Assistant National Statistician, Social Sector Statistics Service at the Philippine Statistics Authority. Um, she has been working on social statistics for about five years and 36 years in the statistical agency across many sectors as, as an ag economist, as a survey statistician, so um, a great expert. So I'll turn to you now, Vilma, for your perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, everyone. I thank the UNSD for engaging the Philippines oh, in this World Data this Forum. This such a difference. We're so fresh. So maybe I'll just go around. Hello. Just, shop. All right. Reminder to speaker: any everyone mute except for Vilma. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad to share the efforts of the Philippine Statistics Authority in responding to the challenges of COVID-19 in data generation. So early on, the Philippine president declared the state of public health emergency on the ninth day of March 2020. In response to then. 10 confirmed uh, COVID cases, including a non Filipino fatality. Pursuant to this presidential proclamation, a memorandum on the imposition of enhanced community quarantine and the stringent social distancing measures was issued initially for 28 days from 17 March 2020 and will last until 15 May 2020 on second extension. So COVID-19 pandemic brought stoppage of work on site, uh, schools, as well, businesses, and transportation. And social distancing measures are strictly implemented by national and local government units and uniformed men, especially at the national capital region, where 66% of the COVID cases of, of today um, is um, being monitored right now. But despite the challenging situation, we cannot stop the statistical activities and the provision of products and services to inform evidence-based narratives on the impact of COVID-19 on the Filipinos and the economy. The need for data cannot be overemphasized to be much more now than when situations are norm normal. In terms of uh, data support to COVID-19 related policies, plans, and programs. Uh, on the first slide, please. Uh, for the day-to-day, -day, um, first slide, please. For the day-to-day -day monitoring uh, of the number of COVID-19 confirmed cases recovered and deaths, these are generated from uh, administrative data by the Department of Health who incidentally came up with a COVID-19 tracker and uh, a data collect app for purposes of collecting uh, epidemi epidemiology of COVID-19 in the country, uh, COVID-19 testing centers, health facilities, and, and the like. The PSA, on the other hand, 
uh, collects and generates strategic data statistics that represents the general population and economic characteristics in unemployment, general price trend by inflation, given by inflation, and national accounts, among others. How did we, do we respond to the challenge? It is possible that PSA personnel may contact COVID-19 during surveys. So on the next slide, as our first response to this. Next slide, please. We assess our authority as the primary data provider of the government. Uh, the PSA requested for exemption from the end so we can do our surveys, but with all precautionary measures to protect the health of PSA personnel. Secondly, we prepared well, including the conduct of consultation with the person from the ground to determine um, uh, any challenges conducting data collection to determine the logistical support needed, like transportation and personal uh, protective equipment and vision of hazard pay. We also need to be innovative employing non-traditional interview approaches and non-traditional tools for data collection. So for the first time, I just use the are ever reliable face-to-face -face interview which is done whenever possible or tele interview if the is available or the computer web interview using online questionnaire or electronic questionnaire if the respondent has access to the internet. This is to say business not usual in unusual situations for the statistical agency. To name a few of the activities under COVID-19 response, PSA is sharing with groups, institutions like Interagency Task Force on COVID-19 Technical Working Group on Data Analytics for the use of the 2018 and 2019 uh, civil registration database on the cause of death. The PSA is um, the software PWG on data analytics. Other parts include academics, the Asian Development Bank, the Philippine Competition Commission, which also studies social, economic, and health of COVID-19. Uh, there was also a real sharing agreement with the Department of Finance for the 2018 and 2019 data file of the labor force survey with provincial codes to inform the formulation of policy recommendations to help the economy at the end of COVID-19. Also with IO speaks for the 2019 on labor survey within standard in code and Philippine uh, standard occupation codes for the COVID-19 uh, in labor market in the Philippines. Moreover, on the next slide, the PSA continued to provide statistical tables with the aggregation we usually do to policy makers and legislators, and some of which are uh, the Department of Labor and Employment, the number of employed persons by region as input to the por formulation of response to workers affected affect by COVID-19, to the number of employed persons in human health and social work activities um, in public and sectors which may serve as input into to determining available plan claim this is the need to proceed. Uh, for that AF also we provided projected population in COVID epicenter national capital region. Now the number of Filipino families within the sixth and seventh decile income group was also provided as basis for the social amelioration program of the government. Furthermore um, on the next slide, the PSA continued to do and release regular products and services like the inflation report, which inform any impact of COVID-19 on price. The labor for survey with inclusion of COVID-19 uh, effects on employment and the national, uh, which is now based on the 18, to provide a picture of the impact of COVID-19 among other products and services. The to uh, I think 22, from May 2020 to September 2020 because uh, we cannot do the training because of the 
social distancing policy of the ball. The national ID will plan for the mass registration from July to December. Let me understand we can the budget support the ball and Thank you. Thank you, Vilma. Yes, thank you so much. And apologies for some for whom the audio was choppy. Um, the organizers at UNSD will distribute Vilma's uh, presentation and the other presentations afterwards as well. So um, now we can turn to a couple of questions for our panelists. Um, and one question that comes up, given um, that we're using new data sources, that we're looking at mobility patterns, that we're asking for openness and transparency, because we realize that you know crowdsourcing the analysis and interpretation of this data is very useful. Can um, several of you speak to the issue of privacy in that context? How to assure anonymization? Um, how to uh, assure the population that the data is being used in, in a way that it's intended to, to build a more effective response um, and to respect rights. So maybe, um, unfortunately, Chris had to leave. So perhaps we'll start with Ramesh on that. Um, are there conversations about this issue uh, inside the government of India? What, what are you thinking about this issue? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's quite important question, especially this in relation to stigma and knowing somebody where they live and then having that person be identified as a COVID patient, uh, the government is actually quite serious about these issues. What they have done for an analysis purposes, uh, the data is quite safely guarded uh, in terms of understanding and declaring a district being COVID free or a city block being COVID free. Um, address is anonymized to the point where you will only be able to actually uh, say uh, block A consists of, let's say, 4,000 people, there will be X number of them could be positive. That's the extent to which you can see on the map, but not to geographically locate a person's house address. That's prohibited in the way in which it's been uh, administered. Secondly, uh, is that the, uh, the analysis right now done is at the district level. Uh, district level analysis of total number of cases will not give you the location data, consequently, you can safely go there and say to that point. But if you were to be tracked and want to be identified and guarded, then a government of India has uh, requested their citizens to put the, a particular app that will geolocate you if you're a, a patient, especially it's helpful for other contacts who will come close to you. There are mechanisms for that to happen. But guarding of privacy, security, confidential of data at the time of collection is actually uh, practice here very well, um, but what is not allowed is to share the granular data for analytical purposes. That that data sets is only stopped at the level of district, and that's how they're managing. But for case management, they have everything about that person, uh, including their date of birth and their relatives and the, all the contacts that come with that case, and uh, what their, uh, if they were a traveler, all the arrival departure records, all the airline manifest related to that, who was sitting next to them, all the contacts that came, they're all there. But for public use, uh, that's prohibited in so far as address is concerned. That's how they're handling it. Thanks, Ramesh. Frankie? Um, yes, yeah, so um, similarly, um, privacy and ethics is incredibly important um, in this area. I think in terms of ONS specifically, um, we, have, um, we have legislation in the UK um, that protects the, um, the privacy um, of individuals, but also does allow um, the ONS um, access to, uh, to personalised data in for analytical and statistical purposes. But in order to do that, we, um, we effectively have an ethics and self-assessment tool, so any projects um, that we want to use in terms of data um, have to go through uh, an ethics assessment. And also, we obviously, once the data has been taken in and we've, we've matched and linked it, we then anonymize it so that um, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, securing um, people's privacy um, and individuals. Um, in terms of the slightly broader, broader picture, um, the UK is looking in terms of the contract uh, tracing, uh, contact tracing app. 
Um, but that would be very much on an opt-in basis um, and people would have to choose to participate and sign up um, for the app in terms of uh, then um, tracing any contacts uh, more widely than that. So, so it's something that um, we do take very seriously. We absolutely um, want to ensure that we maintain people's um, privacy um, because um, on an ongoing basis, uh, we need people to be willing and able to, to share their data and so that we can provide the insight um, and analysis that we need. And if we lose that public trust, um, that's going to become um, very difficult to do. Um, so yeah, so we've kind of got things in place. And if anybody's interested in those, um, in terms of how we go about um, looking after that kind of data governance, there's, there's information on the ONS website, um, which we can share. Great, thanks, Frankie. Vilma, have, uh, have you at the PSA thought about this issue? What are, what are you thinking? Uh, in the Philippines, uh, we also have a legislation. We call it the Data Privacy Act. And even in the uh, reports of the COVID-19 from the Department of Health, uh, they do not divulge the names of the individuals who are affected by the COVID unless there is a permission from the person uh, to uh, be publicly known for, for her name. But for the data from the Philippine Statistics Authority, uh, from the surveys that we are conducting and from the censuses, we make sure that the data files are anonymized before these are, share, before these are shared publicly in our website. And in certain cases, for researchers, for legislators and policymakers, we may share more detailed information, but a data sharing agreement is signed by both parties to protect the data is used only for the purpose mentioned in the agreement and that they will not share the data to other users. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Vilma. Um, one question um, uh, which sort of alludes to switching modalities to kind of cell phone based um, uh, data collection efforts. Um, there's, there's two questions related to that. So one is um, whether the response rate on phone survey data is uh, obviously skewed to the, the better off. Um, it, do, are you finding that a problem in the UK? But obviously it would especially be a problem in lower middle income countries. How do we cope with that um, bias as was uh, flagged by some? And then uh, the, also, Frankie, you raised the issue of uh, the missing, you know, maybe firms are closed and don't respond. So how do you cope with this missing data? Do you impute certain, do you make certain assumptions? So maybe we could have a little round on, um, there's some great advantages of switching to different modalities in terms of the frequency and the relevance, but, you know, are the biases too too big to well tell us a little bit about how the biases are affecting and what you're doing to address that thanks so in terms of um uh, i guess the, the first question around the wealthier um population so um i don't know that we've specifically done an estimate of new biases yet i can um, um i suspect we're still looking into that um, at at the moment, but we're also what we are looking at doing is we're using our or we are using obviously our methodology colleagues in terms of trying to um, look at in terms of modelling and understanding um, how we can um, impute the the missing data. But we're also looking to triangulate that um, in terms of other administrative data sources. So, for example, um, with businesses looking at VAT returns or um, um, our uh, what we call our sort of employment records in the sense of whether payments um, or salaries are still being made to people under payroll as opposed to the furlough arrangement. So we're looking to see how we can use other data to help triangulate um, uh, and understand that that missing data. But I can I can come back to people specifically in terms of whether we've actually um, estimated um, the biases. I'm, I'm not um, aware of that. Um, and then in terms of the other question, uh, which was, um, so for your opinion, again, similarly within, with inflation, we're looking, um, and, and that's quite an interesting topic because obviously we, um, in terms of inflation, we've been looking at the, um, the basket of goods. And one of the things that we, um, that have just obviously dropped out of the basket completely is, um, is airline prices, for example. 
So again, we're still looking at the methodology work in terms of how do we effectively um, uh, make um, sensible adjustments in terms of trying to ensure that we don't have that bias, um, but we're still working on that at the moment. Okay, thanks. Dilma, I, I think I heard you say that you're continuing with um, sort of routine household survey, but taking measures to protect surveyors. Um, are, are you also doing other kinds of or new kinds of data collection and, and what are you finding in terms of biases? Uh, yes, Amanda, as I have mentioned, actually, for the first time we are trying uh, the telephone interview and the computer assisted, I mean, computer web first, uh, how we, we call it, uh, computer assisted web interview, wherein we have the online questionnaire and the electronic questionnaire. But for the telephone interviews, of course, in cases where these are not penetrable because these are under uh, community uh, quarantine, enhanced community quarantine, what our interviewers did was to get the, the telephone numbers and many actually have provided such. And there are also situations where uh, online questionnaire were used uh, by certain respondents, but still, there are many of our respondents, especially in the labor force survey, which is the first survey that we did during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, majority are still uh, uh, allowing the use of face-to-face uh, -face interview with all the masks, with all the uh, PPEs or personal protective equipment, uh, and the likes. That's it. Okay, thanks. Ramesh, you talked a lot about administrative data. Um, can you talk about how you're using survey data? Are you using other other sources? How are you? Uh, how is the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare working with some of the the, the National Statistics Agency um, and otherwise? Yes. Actually, uh, let me first go back and kind of paint the picture of what kinds of data sets and the level of granularity that the system has. So there is kind of a total survey of all facilities, literally speaking, that's connected to health in any, any way, including diagnostic centers to all the way to pharmacies and public and private, we're talking about, that is around uh, 680,000, something like that data, okay? So it's, it's a huge volume of data, uh, 700,000, maybe, yeah, that's uh, approximately that number. They all have geolocations, they all have location data, and they are being disaggregated to public and private. And in fact, for COVID facilities, a large number of COVID facilities are privately participating. They're already disclosing the number of beds and number of uh, uh, you know, isolation wards that they have, so on and so forth, including the level of ventilators, PPEs, ICUs, oxygen uh, attached beds, uh, bedside uh, attachments, and so on. So there is a large amount of that data. And population data is available at the level of a um, well, fourth level of an administrative boundary, if you will. And we're trying to get to the fifth level, the village level data that is already in there that we can uh, uh, ability to map then the you know the non-health sector data such as the schools the distribution of schools the total number of school uh, individuals enrolled public and private for whole of india is available that is being extracted just to because their you know the declaration during the epidemic act means you need to be able to understand the geography in the context of health not just geographic information but geographic data sets so that is how uh, India is kind of uh, layering this, uh, what do you call the X number of data sets to make sense and the disease is sitting on the very top. So when we're talking about the COVID data in so far as cases and contacts and the health facilities, they are in the geographic context and other elements are operating, including the private, uh, sorry, public health safety and security, airports, airlines, and then uh, train stations and port of entries, all of those are layers of data. They are. So we call them as integrated health information platform. And in a way, it is an integrated, plus for, integrated platform for health. So in other words, health is a higher level objective, not just a human health, but animal health in the context of the system. So these data sets now are being on demand called in to create a particular product. In other words, an interpretation of a graph or a chart. So we lots of things are happening. Surveys are not, 100% used, but the the closest one is uh, uh, what do you call the, um, the, the 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 census survey that happens, where large amount of data is collected, 
and and almost all people are captured in that process is being integrated into the system. That's how we are getting the actually household level numbers. But there are also other surveys done for malaria program for X number of other programs where data sets are all sitting where individual house level data exists at the level of a village for a huge number of villages because these uh, vertical programs are going on for a very long time. So now that's all being kind of extracted and layered into on demand for analysis. So if you think about comorbidities, you, you know, comorbidities and also hospital based infections, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, at the level of admission, lots of um, uh, what do you call the uh, symptoms and signs that are being captured that needs to be understood in the context of a health behavior. We need different kinds of data sets. So depends on the question that the health ministry is asking, we are able to construct layers based on accessing the data sets. So survey as a whole um, is quite uh, what you call spotty in India, but very specific and it's answering very specific things. Sometimes because survey as a nature is not complete, uh, we won't be able to generalize. But whereas health data, what we are talking in the COVID context, in the health information system context, is highly granular, specific, and a consolidated total data. So um, uh, I wish I can talk about more on the architecture of the information system that is the statistical data outputs uh, that maybe in a, some other conversation we should have that in a detailed way. Thank you. Yes, we should have a follow-up webinar. But let, let me ask you, there are so many efforts to collect data, there, there are two kind of interrelated questions. So one is, what's the role of the National Statistical Agency or Office in coordinating these multiple national data collection efforts? Obviously, you know, the health ministry or the health service is going to be generating the administrative data. We might have health insurers generating claims data. We might have household surveys, et cetera. What's the role of the NSO in putting that all together um, and, and relating to policy makers. And then the second question that I have, just I'll ask you to answer them both at once and I'll, and I'll go through starting um, with um, Ramesh. We'll start with Ramesh this time and end with uh, Frankie to move things up. But the second is, you know, a lot of the comparative data that's out there is sitting on university or NGO sites, not um, part of official data systems. Um, you know, of course, WHO has its um, reports of case counts and things like that. But how do we build a more global platform to create COVID-19 sort of data repositories that enable uh, comparisons uh, using standardized definitions? If you can reflect a little bit on what we need to do differently, better. And another question I'm just going to put out to you because I'm so curious about it is that, and this is true in the United States as well, the models that are coming out on um, what the trajectory of this epidemic is it, are coming mainly from university sources and not from government. And I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on why that is. Normally, we would see something, it was almost like we were not very well prepared and the universities had the capacity and our public health agencies that would normally do it only had flu modeling capacity. I'm not sure. There's lots of different possible hypotheses. But if you could reflect a little bit about What's going on here, and how does that change the way we should be doing business in the future? So let's yeah. start with Selma. So uh, back going backwards, I will answer all the three uh, just to give you one quick uh, insight. Uh, India, for example, as you know, is quite well positioned in data analytics and software engineering projections, this and that, enormously. They are quite there is a there is a war room uh, called war room or you want to call them an analytics room whatever that room is completely full of uh, engineers using the data for modeling purposes for government of india for internal consumption it's a confidential process because they're using enormous number of um, sensitive data to do projections that are nearly accurate for the uh, uh, decisions that the government needs to take they don't get published they will never get published because of various reasons because of privacy regulations and so on and so forth so I, I am 100% aware fully that India is doing fantastic projections in so far as um, what if scenarios and also um, doubling rates and precision modeling to the point where they would be able to unlock or lockdowns to be taken off from district level. So that is happening. 
not publishable for various reasons. So uh, that's not the discussion here, but just to give you an assurance that that modeling is happening. And many academicians are proposing many different kinds of models. Assumptions in the model determine the model's robustness, as you know well. So there are many, many iterations of assumptions being vetted through, and WHO helped to the government of India in many ways to think through the process. So we gave them what is uh, known as the constants and variables within the model to make sure those values are taken into account to construct uh, you know, construct uh, an algebraic expression, if you will, to show us total number of cases that will be double at a given population based on the social demographic values and so on and so forth. So it's working very well. In so far as global uh, effort in terms of platforms, what NGOs can do, I can tell you right now, you know, um, we have never come in the statistical community or in general speaking, minimum data set concept. We don't have a minimum data set that is agreed globally um, that is going to be given in so far as what is minimum of the minimum that needs to be collected for, for example, COVID-19. Case investigation forum, we have, WHO has published different versions of that. Uh, but case investigation forum is highly granular, quite tedious, and a large amount of data is in terms of management use. But if you want to do statistical use, what would be the minimum data set required for statistical projections? And also lessons learned that we are doing as to what are the critical data as opposed to nice to have data or as opposed to something that you would like to have for projections. So in other words, that in and of itself is an intellectual exercise we must take into account. We, I was uh, in response to Ebola, we were in uh, West Africa, same things we did. Uh, construct another uh, in a whole iteration of exercises of data collection instruments. I think we need to come up with what you call the minimum data sets for condition A through X of the diseases that are known to be of emerging and re-emerging threats. And that extracted out would be a statistical output that statistical officers need to uh, kind of take into account for managing resources, especially financial and medical resources, including human resources related to uh, health workforce. Now, going up to the last question of NSO's role in this uh, particular process, uh, how NSOs are going to be the, the, the custodians of national statistical offices being the custodians of the quote unquote purified and distilled data sets that actually gives you the overall painting. For example, COVID and economy. And if you were to do analysis of COVID on the economy, it should be geographically uh, focused and it is granular enough for a county office or a particular small district can use the data. So that means what would be the minimum data set? How are you going to harness all of this? See, private sector data and uh, the, the civil society at large, if you will, their data are passion driven. They are not necessarily driven based on what you call um, validations of uh, why you use an indicator as opposed to another indicator. Universities are more so better than that, but universities do not do national level. They do very community level. So national statistical officers are torn in terms of using beautifully extracted data of a very small scope versus something that is done in a national level that is not of that high value. So in this kind of context, you know, in Indian statistical office, for example, they have a huge number of demand-based questions to which they will answer. Right now, the parliament tells the Ministry of Health uh, please answer the question A, B, and C, and eventually statistical office have to document them because they may come back it again. So that means they will need to streamline the process. I go back to again, minimum data set. We really need to have, a, and, and then of course, the, the definitions, case definition, standardizing the case definition, uh, and then standardizing the geographic hierarchy within a country, make sure all people use the same nomenclature and same uh, uh, geospecific codes, pin code or zip code or whatever codes, plus the code codified data related to administrative boundaries. It has to be standardized. Otherwise, statistics do not mean much when you are mixing and matching geographic hierarchy. And then the third is, because uh, emerging and re-emerging threats are based uh, heavily in so far as containment based on case definitions and case definitions largely change, we need to somehow come up with a higher level case definition that people can use and then amend that as it goes along to the lower granularity for sensitivity and specificity based on the geographic region. So this case definition and surveillance, you know, uh, it's teaching us something about standardization of data and data sets. And then of course, you need to have standards in terms of terminologies, ICD-11, ICD-10, SNOMED, LANG, DICOM, all of those things are very useful in this conversation because they're all amounting to clean statistical data. 
mortality data, cause of death, cause of death need to be, uh, you know, uh, classified in ICD-10 or 11, depending upon the country, and modalities of death and comorbidities. These are all standardized way to do. So we all have to agree. And I think this forum, your forum right now, is a fantastic forum to have a serious discussion about the minimum data set approach uh, into for the statistical purposes on uh, communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases in categorical terms, focus whether it's on mortality or economy or you know disease-based expenditure, whatever else, we need to f be disciplined enough to have facilitated conversation. For that. Sorry for the long answer, but thank you very much. It was a good answer. Thank you, Tarmesh. So, Wilma, what are your thoughts? Yeah, hello. Any yes, go ahead. Okay, so let me start with a question on the role of the NSOs in coordinating the national data collection efforts uh, in the current crisis. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, the preeminence of saving lives and protecting the health of the people is the priority of the government and they have to be informed in the quickest way possible. So in this kind of situation, daily or even more frequent than daily data collection is critical in supporting the management of COVID-19 cases because that's the top priority. In situations like this, data collection using transactional and administrative data from the health institutions and local government units are the most helpful and the quickest and most uh, feasible approach. So the non-traditional uh, uh, surveys uh, and censuses uh, is really uh, of uh, paramount importance during situations like this. This is why in the Philippines, an interagency task force for the management of emerging infectious diseases, or the IATF in short, was created where one of the technical working group is for anticipatory and forward planning under which a technical sub technical working group on data analytics was created for PSA is a member. So combining um, the administrative data with uh, the the data that we have from our civil registration uh, from our uh, uh, inflation report, uh, from the labor and employment, the latest uh, that we have, they they this information plus of course the other data uh, coming from other uh, monitoring of the COVID-19 um, is uh, being uh, more full. So uh, the PSA is also top uh, for uh, the most recent population projection, income and poverty statistics. Labor and employment, inflation, uh, accounts, uh, complement the need of cases uh, related to the administrative function of the healthcare uh, institutions. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, comparability of statistics, uh, regarding the comparability of statistics, incidentally, in the Philippine uh, statistical system, we call it. Uh, is part of the interagency um, they are capacitated and they are trained on the use standards somehow and uh, for the transactional data on COVID-19 they are actually the accountable institutions in looking at this one but later on in our regular or routine survey we have also in uh, COVID-19 19 questions to be able to provide a more uh, general population impact of the COVID-19 later. Uh, so that I can say Thank about you, Vilma. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, Frankie, do you want to weigh in on this? Hello. Uh, yeah, so in terms of um, the roles of ONS coordinating, so um, I mean, in, in terms of it, it does depend on when the, where the uh, NSO fits in the government structure. So. Um, within the UK, um, the ONS doesn't have a statutory function um, to coordinate the national data collection effort, but because of our breadth of experience, we have 
naturally sort of taken on that role. So, so we're kind of taking that on to, to some degree. Um, we also do look in terms of trying to, um, we've brought a team of um, analysts together and um, keeping track of requests and advice to government so that we can try and make sure that we're coordinating that with other government departments who also have an interest in the subject matter. So, for example, we liaise closely with our Department for Health um, and social care organisations around the figures to try and feed those through to policy makers. Um, so, our experience in some other NSOs, they don't necessarily have um, such a strong coordination function um, because they have a more uh, decentralised fiscal system. Um, so, I think it just does depend um, in terms of the, the setup of, of the government. Um, so, in terms of the question around um, uh, the academics and why they have um, uh, come up with models um, more quickly, I think that, um, if I'm honest, I think that's partly down to academia probably having more agile structures uh, and potentially um, being a bit less constrained sometimes than government. And I also think there's a degree of um, independence that I think um, they can bring and that perhaps um, that sometimes is trickier from uh, government departments. So our um, scientific advisors group on emergencies is, is very much a independent scientific group. Um, there are a lot of academics um, on that group, um, and they will bring their expertise in terms of the um, the modelling that they've been doing. Um, and then by looking across those range of different um, data in different models. And then that group can come to a consensus in terms of um, feeding through advice um, to to the government. Um, in terms of the standards, um, I think I couldn't agree more with um, my uh, other uh, co-presenters in terms of the need to have better standards. I think it's interesting, um, having spent a bit of time in economic statistics, there are clear frameworks if you think about um, the um, the UN standards around um, uh, economic statistics, and, and that provides a really clear framework um, in terms of the standards, but also to help in terms of comparability. Um, so if there's anything there in terms of thinking about those types of standards that could uh, or frameworks that we could introduce um, to help um, us all uh, address um, the, the sort of the data needs um, in a consistent way. I think that would be something uh, uh, very welcomed. Um, and in the UK, uh, we are at the moment setting up a data standards um, authority um, where the ONS is working with our colleagues in um, our government digital service to try and bring in standards um, for data across government so that when we are looking to share data, when we're looking to link it and match it, um, we've got um, better standards to make that more straightforward and also to help improve the quality um, of the data that we're trying to use in terms of analysis and statistics. And um, so that's something that we, we were kind of at the beginning of really in terms of that journey. Um, but we hope it's something that we're going to, that this situation um, I think is um, highlighting the importance of that and, and perhaps giving it some well, well needed momentum in terms of trying to get that set up more effectively um, in, the, in the UK. Great. Well, that's a good list. I I think, um, well, we're nearing the end of our time. And our last question was, if the sky was the limit and you had no budgetary or technology constraints, what data solutions would be most useful? But let me ask you a little footnote. And that is that in a lot of lower middle income countries, the completeness of death registration, and forget about the timeliness, but the, just the completeness in a year period is, is still quite low. In some countries, less than half of deaths are registered, for example, um, and forget cause of death. Um, there have been efforts to strengthen that kind of basic uh, data set, but you know, mo our progress has been modest. Can you reflect from your experiences, I think that the Philippines is much better at this and India making some progress. What, you know, okay, one is the magic wand. And then the second question is, what about the basics? How can we really do better on the basics? And, and also any concluding remarks that you have so that we can wrap up our hour. So let's start um, this time uh, with Wilma. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, if the sky's the limit, no, you know, what would be uh, most helpful? Uh, I would like to believe personally that surveys and censuses remain to be a reliable platform, but with the use of advanced ICT in data collection and data processing and dissemination, and this will have to be combined with JU special information so that uh, we can make, uh, you know, uh, sexy stories, uh, data stories, uh, and uh, ideal, that would be ideal for analysis to support planning and policy formulation from the grassroots up. And this would entail uh, the role, uh, the, the, a well-trained and capacitated local government units to be doing the statistical data collection uh, and generation using platforms for real-time data collection, aggregation, and information dissemination. So I think uh, that's all from the Philippines, and I really am very uh, grateful for uh, engaging us. I'm learning a lot also from the other speakers uh, in this uh, World Data Forum. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you, Velma. Okay, Ramesh, uh, final words, the magic wand. Yeah, Ramesh, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, you are all statisticians, so I can simply say, first register birth. All births must be recorded. And unique identifiers countries must develop if they have not developed and must attach UIDs to the birth records. Death will come after that when so far as recording because we can't start a death even though death is easier to count than birth because a large number of people are in India like born. So if we can create a birth and death registry that needs to be simple and standardized and it must start with facilities and then to communities. We don't have a basic standard. We have two elaborate descriptions of the minimum standard. So if I had a magic wand, I want all the, the every country in the world must have a UID, unique identifiers for their citizens or persons, followed by registration of birth and followed by registration of death. Everything else in, is in between. We, can, we can attach all other discussions of in between birth and death because of a UID. Without that, we are chasing the data and trying to come up with statistics. So that's my my work. Thanks. Good. A good final comment. Are you? Um, uh, I would uh, I would agree with Ramesh there. I think it's um, uh, having a, 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 a single ID to help um, in terms of, um, uh, of, of kind of tracking both businesses and, and potentially individuals. I'm not tracking, sorry, that's the right word, but they're trying to in terms of helping us link different data um, together um, would be uh, would be helpful. Um, I think um, um, that's quite a sensitive topic in the UK, um, so uh, how likely that is, um, I, I'm not sure. But I think for me, it kind of links into the fact about just having almost a shift in, in mindset that, um, that, that across within the UK, but more globally, that, that there is sort of public acceptability um, of mechanisms that would allow us to uh, rapidly share data to link it, but in a safe um, environment with using, you know, ethically sound um, approaches so that that could be used for statistics and, and research. So there's a sort of willingness. So rather than um, there's a mindset switch that people willingly share data because they understand that it's for the public good as long as it's done anonymously and it's done secure, to securely um, and it's, you know, it's kept and their privacy is protected. And so that people can see the good um, of what we're trying to do um, so that when these situations that we're doing at the moment, we can get hold of the data that we're needed. Um, so I suppose it's kind of linking to Ramesh, but taking it into that, that sort of understanding that for the public good, but within carefully uh, good governance, good ethics, good, um, good safety and security, um, that we, we can get um, access to that data. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely true. If, if we violate uh, the trust of those that are providing their information and data, it will be very hard to get accurate information and data going forward. Um, and uh, just to say on the quality of the basic systems of civil registration and uh, DAS, uh, somebody on the chat, uh, I would have to verify this, but they said in Brazil, the data is better on burials than on cause of death. So. That gives you a sense of where we stand. And when you read the models and projections of where things stand, uh, given that very poor underlying data infrastructure, uh, you can imagine the caveats that we have to put on our interpretation. So 
with that, thank you so much to the panelists, the speakers, and our participants. Um, please follow the website and Twitter for upcoming webinars. Um, the Twitter handle at UN Data Forum, hashtag UN Data Forum. And there will be a Twitter chat just now at 12 p.m. using the hashtag COVID data chat. Um, but thank, thanks to all of you for your very thoughtful comments and insights. And I, I hope we'll have a chance uh, to talk again. Thanks to all. Bye bye. Thank you, Bubba. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. See you.